Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm going to share with you case number 221 in the Best Way to Do Cataract Surgery series. This is a cataract, and you're going to see areas of zonular dehiscence throughout the case. And I want to actually pause the video and show you the areas of zonular weakness that I see. And then I'm going to place a capsule retention ring and then a three-piece lens. This is the LI61AO lens. We've been trialing that lens most recently. And so you're going to see throughout this case signs that I'm going to find for you as to why this patient has zonular weakness. So this is off the bat. You can see first there's a central area of lens fibrosis or something like that. And you can see some areas of capsule stria. So you can see right there, there's some stria in the lens or in the capsule. Hard to tell, but again, that's an atypical sign. You don't see that in normal situations. And this give, gives me a little bit of indication that there may be some zonular laxity or some zonular weakness. I go ahead and make my paracentesis incision first on the right side and then the left side, making sure I'm parallel to iris plane, which creates a nice corneal shelf, which will allow me to achieve a self-sealing incision. This is intracameral epinephrine, and then some dispersive viscoelastic to coat the corneal endothelium and flatten the anterior capsule. You can see when I push the viscoelastic, the lens bowed back significantly. You can see towards me, approximately in the subincisional area, that there is some zonular lax. I can see actually the edge of the lens. And so that's a, your, another clue that there's some zonular weakness here as I push the viscoelastic into the anterior chamber. I'm using my micro forceps to puncture the center of the capsule for my capsule rexus. Before I do that, I'm just measuring once more, and it's hard to really see the corneal mark. But you see, as I push down to puncture, again, these are sharp tips. As I push down, you can see there's some capsule folds right there where that circle is. And the capsule fold is an indication of zonular weakness. Again, these are sharp tip forceps. You shouldn't see those capsule folds as I try to push down. But because the zonules are weak, as I push down, it causes a wrinkle or a dimple or stria within the anterior capsule. Again, that is a sign that the zonules are not providing adequate counterforce to keep the capsule on stretch. And therefore, when you dimple down and you push down with the rexus forceps in the center, it causes a little dimpling and folds within the capsule. I go ahead and puncture the center and I pull down and I grab the right side of the tear. I go around circumferentially. The rexus goes rather uneventfully. And in these cases, it's very important to make a rexus just the right size. You don't want it too small, so it's to be difficult to disassemble the lens. You don't want to make the rexus too big in case you have to place a capsule tension ring or capsule tension segment. You want to have adequate anterior capsule support. So this is the capsule fornix hydrodissection technique. I'm trying to get under the rexus edge, and look what happens. I'm very gentle. I always slide very gently under the rexus edge, but because there's not a lot of zonular counterforce, look, it creates this area of stretch. As I'm trying to slide that cannula under the rexus edge, you're seeing the stretch of the zonules. And so that stretch of the zonules is, again, another indication that there's some zonular weakness. So I go ahead and decompress the bag after hydrodissection, and I'm very carefully sweeping under the rexus edge. I'm not going to be overly aggressive trying to turn the lens. This is the type of case you don't want to be aggressive when you turn the lens, because if you do, you can actually rip the zonules. All of these cases just require attention to detail and just acute awareness of your surroundings as you're doing the case, in particular when you're dealing with zonular weakness. So I lift the incision, I go in with irrigation off, activate irrigation, and I'm in the dense cataract setting mode. And I switch to quad mode to remove the surface lens material. I turn bevel up now. And you can see here, I forgot to switch back to sculpt. But I'm in quad mode. I'm able to still disassemble the lens. I'm, I'm noticing things are just a little bit weird because it's not 
sculpting like typical. And again, only in retrospect did I realize that I was in quad mode the entire time. So not as efficient as far as sculpting power. I have unnecessary vacuum during this step. But again, I don't think it was detrimental to be in quad mode to sculpt. I switched the bevel down. And then I realized here that I was in quad mode. And so you can see I was kind of paused because I didn't have to switch the setting. I placed the chopper around the rexus edge contra incisionally, and I performed the terminal chop, fracturing the lens from the opposing side. Because it's on the terminal side, I'm able to fracture the lens through and through and avoid the posterior plate phenomenon. I placed the chopper under the right hemonucleus, hooking the peripheral lens and crushing it centrally toward the fingertip, fracturing the lens in completely in half, and that is a cross chop. Performing the same maneuver around that first quadrant, hooking the peripheral lens, crushing it with opposing forces against the fingertip, and that is another cross chop maneuver to disassemble that first quadrant, breaking that first quadrant into, into smaller and smaller pieces, and then emulsifying the lens piece. Very important when you're dealing with cases of zonular weakness, not to put any additional traction on the zonules. So again, separate that second quadrant from the rest of the lens. And I'm just, it's just kind of loose. So I go ahead and just use some vacuum to gobble it up. Very carefully, I'm turning the lens. And you only want to turn the lens when it easily turns, right? You don't want to apply unnecessary stress on the zonules if the lens doesn't want to turn. If it turns, great. If it doesn't, then you have to employ a different technique to get that lens out of the bag. So I turn that second hemonucleus in front of me, placing the chopper around the lens, hooking the peripheral lens, crushing the lens against the fingertip. And again, that is another cross chop maneuver, separating the two quadrants and then placing the chopper around the third quadrant, hooking the peripheral lens, making sure I get around the lens completely. And again, this is all under irrigation only. There's no vacuum, there's no ultrasound. By doing it this way, this is a very controlled way to disassemble the lens, again, purely under irrigation forces and using mechanical fracturing forces solely to disassemble the lens. I'm not grabbing it with vacuum. I'm not using ultrasonic energy. Again, whenever you do that and you have a weak zonules, you might have a floppy bag. You don't want to accidentally grab the bag with high vacuum. So in this context, I feel like using high vacuum is a liability and a detriment. And that's why using mechanical fracturing forces, purely using irrigation fluid without any vacuum, I feel like gives you really excellent control to disassemble this lens. So you can see I'm very carefully and methodically disassembling that fourth quadrant, hooking the peripheral lens with the chopper, fracturing the lens pieces into smaller pieces. You see here there's a little attachment on the posterior aspect. And because I'm just using irrigation, I'm able to very carefully position the two instruments, even very close to the posterior capsule, but I don't care because I'm not using vacuum. And I can just position the lens such a way that the two instruments are around the lens and I'm able to crush the lens with mechanical forces. Again, a very controlled way, methodical way, without using high vacuum, very controlled way to disassemble the lens. Again, just positioning the lens in such a way that the instruments are around the lens and I'm able to use the instruments to crush the lens into smaller pieces and then emulsify the lens pieces. Once all the endonucleus is removed, go ahead and very carefully remove the epinucleus with vacuum, placing the chopper deep to protect the posterior capsule. So I take the chopper out, push PSS in, take the fake tip out, and I go in with the ionic handpiece. And you'll see here immediately, once I start to remove the cortex, I always start from anterior to posterior, especially in this case when you have weak zonules. But I'm noticing something. I think that there is some zonular dehiscence sub-incisionally, about two clock hours or so. And so instead of trying to grab the cortex with the vacuum and accidentally pulling zonules, I'm pushing some viscoelastic into the bag, pushing the bag back, and then I'm going after that cortex. And again, you just have to have a feeling. All of this started one, when I started trying to puncture for the rexus and I saw that stria in the capsule sub-incisionally, and then when I pushed viscoelastic to fill the back, I saw the lens bow back a lot. And then you saw that 
clearing where I was able to see the edge of the lens in the subincisional area. Again, that tells me there's some area of zonular weakness in that subincisional area. All of these are clues that tells me that there's probably some a little bit of zonular dehiscence in that area. And you saw I pushed some viscoelastic in the subincisional space because I don't want to grab the zonules accidentally, but obviously I have to get the rest of this cortex off. I got rid of all the other cortex in front of me. I actually have some cortical material in the central posterior capsule as well. I'm trying to go after the subincisional cortex, but you can see right here that there's some stria in the capsular bag, the posterior capsule. So right here, you can see that there's some stria in the posterior capsule, and I'm highlighting it with the red lines right here. You can see those stria lines in the posterior capsule, which tells you there's some areas of zonular weakness, zonular dehiscence perhaps. And so I stop there, and I pulse some BSS into the subincisional area. Another thing that can give you a sign that there's some zonular weakness, if you look at the rexus, that part of the subincisional area, if you see that the rexus is actually smaller than where you actually made the rexus, that tells you that there is some zonular weakness and poor counter-traction, and that's why the rexus edge is more central in that area. Again, not as clear in this case, but in some cases you can actually see that. So I fill the capsular bag with cohesive viscoelastic, and I say to myself, I'm not going to go after any more cortex in the subincisional area. I certainly don't want to cause any more zonular damage. So I fill the bag with cohesive viscoelastic, and I start polishing with the sweep. I polish on the left side and then the right side. But you can see as I'm polishing, you can see there's some wrinkling in the posterior capsule. So I stop and I get the CTR ready. And I like to turn it so that that groove is facing towards me. And I go after the left side eyelet. I make sure that the injector is hook is pointed down. I try to align the injector hook with that left side eyelet. You see that it didn't quite engage, so I stop, and I make sure that the eyelid is all the way in the hook, and then it goes into the injector. I lift the incision with the Lester hook, and then I go in. The CTR is facing to the right. I hook the leading eyelid and I advance the injector in such a way that it causes minimal torsional stress on the capsular bag. I get hung up a little bit here, but then I use a Lester to disengage both the leading and the trailing eyelets. I push some more cohesive viscal. This is the LI61AO lens. It's the one that goes through a smaller injector. You see, I tried to advance the lens, but the haptic started to come out of the incision, and that's because I haven't seated it all the way in. So you see here, I used the cannula to help control the eye, and then I was able to push the injector further into the eye, the tip of the barrel. I filled the capsular bag with cohesive viscoelastic, and this lens is a three-piece lens. It's a very good lens. It's silicone. It's aspheric, and it goes through a 2.4 millimeter incision, which is perfect. The only issue is you want to make sure it doesn't kind of shoot out of the eye. So I make sure the leading haptic is faced to the left. I have to turn the barrel a little bit sideways. I'm kind of supinating my hand. And then you see the optic just shot out. Again, I'm not very experienced with this lens. A lot of folks who are very experienced, they can go ahead and place the trailing haptic into the bag with the injector. But rather than taking a chance, because I'm not as experienced with it, I just go ahead and leave the trailing haptic out of the eye, and then I'm going to dial the trailing haptic into the bag with the Maltzman. So again, evidence for zonular weakness, especially in the subincisional area. I place a capsular tension ring into the eye in, in such a way that I'm able to kind of keep it from opening up all the way by engaging that leading eyelet as I advance the CTR, I'm able to hook it, and then as it comes out, it, it really reduces torsional stress on the capsular bag. I put the three-piece lens, the LI61AO, into the capsular bag as well. Going underneath the lens, removing the viscoelastic from within the bag, I'm trying to peel some of that stubborn posterior capsule lens material. So there's clearly posterior capsule fibrosis, dense cataract. I'm not going to perseverate and try to go after the 
posterior capsule fibrosis. I believe the stria in the capsular bag, at the very beginning of the case that you saw, was on the posterior capsule attached to that posterior capsule fibrosis. So again, all of these are signs that there's zonular weakness. Again, again, posterior capsule fibrosis with stria lines in the capsule, signs of zonular weakness. As I tried to puncture with my sharp tip forceps, it didn't puncture immediately. It actually caused stria. As I tried to puncture, it was actually pushing down on the capsule rather than cutting it. And as it pushed down, because there's less zonular support, it caused those tension lines, those stria lines in the anterior capsule. And that is again a sign of zonular weakness. You saw I did a gentle hydrodissection, a gentle turning of the lens, very gentle when I'm disassembling the lens. I don't apply any torsional stress on the zonules throughout the case. I made sure that the lens was nice and loose. I performed terminal chop and then cross chop and mechanical fracturing forces. Again, when you have weak zonules, you worry about a floppy posture capsule and you don't want to employ high vacuum when you're disassembling the lens. Why do that when you have the risk of the posterior capsule flying up at you? Use just irrigation only, and then mechanical forces to position the instruments to crush the lens. It's very controlled, very methodical, very easy to do. And so this patient ended up having an excellent result. Perfectly centered three-piece lens in the capsule bag with a capsule retention ring, and this patient did very well. I hope that each of these signs of zonular weakness and zonular dehiscence will help you for your future cases. Again, this is not a case where there was significant zonular dehiscence, so you didn't need any more support. You didn't see the bag flopping backward into the vitreous space. So I feel like a capsule retention ring in this case, as well as the three-piece lens, was more than adequate to provide this patient stability. And long-term, you know, if there's a dislocation of the lens, you can actually use a CTR to lasso suture in the future and fixate it to the sclera. So I hope this was helpful to you, and I thank you for your attention.